All right, this is going to be 1 Timothy chapter 2. We meant it down to verse 11. And verse 11 says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. <clears throat> now this would be in the context of the, in the marriage, but it would have to apply to the church as well because if she was the pastor or a big teacher in the church over men, then she's going to end up teaching her own husband. So it says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So, that verse is so plain there. I suffer not a woman to teach. And so if she's teaching, if there's a woman teaching men in your church, that would be in violation to this verse. She's going to end up teaching her husband. And there's other verses that go along with this. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14.34 If you go to 1 Corinthians 14.34 This is going to show you that it isn't just in the context of in the marriage, but in the church as well. And the context in this chapter is speaking in tongues, which we don't do anymore anyway, and prophesying or preaching. So 1 Corinthians 14.34, in that context, it says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it's not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, I don't believe that a woman, this means a woman just can't open her mouth while she's at church. Uh, I believe the context is was tongues and also prophesying or preaching. So when a woman gets up and is preaching to a room full of men, teaching a room full of men, that's in direct disobedience to these verses here. So all the big TV preachers that are women you, that you see, you know, Joyce Meyer, Paula White, Beth Moore, they're in open rebellion to these verses on TV for the world to see. And, you know, there's some pastors probably in your town that are women. They're not even following these simple, plain verses right here. So he says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, But I suffer not a, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So he suffers not a woman to teach. That means allow not. And he says he suffers them not to teach, but they can teach women. Look at Titus 2 and verse 9. This is going to prove to you that it's referring to the men that they shouldn't be teaching. Because in uh, Titus, Titus chapter 2, It's actually going to be verse 3 and 4. It says that the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. That means, becometh holiness means what would match some, match holiness, match somebody that's claiming to be holy. Not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. So they can teach women. And they can teach children. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.5 Even though women are supposed to teach men and have a big preaching job, pastoring position, things like that. They can still teach other women. They can still teach children. 2 Timothy 1.5, When I call to remembrance the 
unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice. And I am persuaded that in thee also. You see, uh, Timothy's grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice were huge roles in his life. It doesn't say anything about his father. His father may have been a lost person. But when it comes to the faith that's in Timothy, most likely that good faith came from, was passed down from his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice, them teaching him the scriptures. And Paul talks about how from a child he knew the Holy Scriptures. Who probably taught him? His grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. So a woman can teach young women. They can teach children. But when it comes to preaching and being a pastor, having authority over, over men, that's just not right. And... He says back in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. When a woman takes that authority position over the man, she ruins the picture. You see in Ephesians 5, he talks about how, let the, well let's just go to it. Ephesians chapter 5, And verse 22, Ephesians 5, 22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. You see, it's given the comparison of the husband and wife to Christ and the church. And if the, hu if the wife is up teaching the husband having authority over the husband, that ruins the picture because it's it's like the church is the head of Christ, you see? Whereas Christ pictured by the, is pictured by the husband, the church is pictured by the wife. The husband is supposed to have authority the way Christ has authority. You see, you ruin the picture when you got a woman up pastoring and preaching. And that's just, it's just weird. You just get an icky feeling. If you, if you know these verses and you see a woman up preaching and there's all these men there in the crowd, I'm, I'm more concerned about the men than I am her, honestly. Why do they not feel icky and do they have no uh, Bible knowledge to where they could get up and, and preach the Bible, teach the Bible? They have to have a woman do it. It just doesn't make any sense. And he, and he says there in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13, For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And we know he made Adam first. He took one of his ribs and made Eve. And that when he put him in a deep, he put it, made a deep sleep come on Adam, right? And that picture's death. And then he, he cut him in his side, got his rib out, and he made the woman out of that rib. Just as Jesus Christ had to die and be cut in the side to get his bride, Adam had to go into a deep sleep and be cut in the side to get his bride. You see the picture again. And it says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Adam wasn't deceived in the matter. He just did it. He knew what he was doing. He did it. He did it because he loved Eve. But the woman was deceived by the devil. 2 Corinthians 11.3 talks about it. It says how, uh, I fear less by any means, uh, you know, how the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. 
So Eve was beguiled in Genesis 3, 1 through 7. She was deceived, and that's why uh, you don't want the woman with a head teaching job. She's more likely to be deceived. And that doesn't make her a bad person. That's just the way it is. Men have their own strengths and faults. Women have their own strengths and faults. Teaching is not one of the, the woman's strengths. And then it says in verse 15, Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So saved in childbearing, that's a big thing to talk about there because that word saved. Now that doesn't mean saved like saved from hell. This is saved from deception. What have we been talking about? The, the woman getting deceived. So when you get to verse 15, she's going to be saved in childbearing if her, if they, her and her husband, continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. You see, when a woman's gone through certain things like childbearing, for example, she's even more likely to be deceived then because she's got all these different th things going on with her body and emotions and stuff. But if her and her husband continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety, they not there's she's going to be a lot less likely to be deceived. And notice it doesn't just say if she continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety, she needs the man there too to help her keep from getting deceived. So, let's look at some verses for this. 1 Timothy 4:16. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. And let's talk about that word saved. It says in 1 Timothy 4.16, Take heed unto thyself, and unto the doctrine continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Once again, this is Paul talking to Timothy. Timothy's already saved when it comes to eternity going to heaven or hell. He's already saved. But if he continues in the doctrine that Paul's gave him, He's going to save himself and others from being deceived. That's the same type of thing that's going on in 1 Timothy 2. This is saved not in the sense of going to heaven or hell. It's saved in the sense of being saved from deception. So, she'll be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Compare with Proverbs 7.11. In Proverbs 7.11, it says, She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now she is without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. Now, if, if you're out doing that and not continuing in faith, and charity and holiness with sobriety, you're uh, way more likely to be deceived. But if you're doing as Paul said in 1 Timothy 2.10, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works, you're a lot less likely to be deceived. Now we can start chapter 3. In 1 Timothy. So 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. Okay, it says in 1 Timothy 3, 1, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So if a man desires the office of a bishop. So first off, we see that the man should desire the office. For chapter 3 is about holding offices. And the first thing you see is the man should desire the office. 
He shouldn't be doing it by constraint. You know, it says in 1 Peter, if you go over to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2, it says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So he needs to be doing it because he desires it. So if a man desire the office of a bishop, a bishop is a is also called a pastor and an elder. Look back at 1 Peter 5 again. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. It says, The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So there you see, it's called uh, an elder and a shepherd or a pastor. You see, a bishop is a pastor and an elder. So you go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3. So the guy needs to desire it the man should desire the office he shouldn't be doing it by constraint so if a man desire the office of a bishop he desireth a good work the office itself is a good work so the man should show himself as a pattern of good works in titus 2 7 it says, In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. So the guy that holds the office of a bishop or that desires the office of a bishop needs to have a pattern of good works. He needs to desire the office, not doing it by constraint. And then, verse 2, a bishop then must be, now that's a big thing, must be, that's present tense, and that's what these qualifications are going to be, you're looking for a pastor, <coughs> you look how he's doing in the present tense, you know, we can look at anyone's past record and find something to disqualify them. You can always look at somebody's past record and just about find anything that you want to find. But the uh, it says, must be. That's present tense, must be. So, a bishop then must be blameless. Okay, what's blameless? Well, it can't mean sinless because Paul said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23 and Paul says about himself, he's the chief of sinners. Paul says about himself, O wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from the body of this death? But this, So this has to be blameless as the steward. Look at Titus 1.7. When it comes to being a steward, he needs to be blameless. In Titus 1.7, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. As the steward of God, he must be blameless. So that it can't mean sinless, but when it comes to being a steward, blameless can't mean sinless because Paul was called blameless, touching the righteousness that was in the law before he was saved. Look at Philippians 3.6. In Philippians 3 and verse 6, Paul says about himself concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Before he was saved, he was persecuting the church. He said, touching the righteousness which is in the law, 
blameless. He wasn't sinless. He was blameless, touching the righteousness which is in the law. And in 1 Timothy 3, it's blameless when it comes to being the steward. And <clears throat> these aren't just qualifications for a pastor. We should also strive to be blameless ourselves. Look at Philippians 2.15. See, a lot of people just want to look at these and say, well, this is just qualifications for a pastor. No, we should all be having, trying to have these same qualities about our life. 2 Timothy 2.15 That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So we, need, we also need to be blameless. And, but when it comes to the qualification for the pastor, he needs to be blameless as the steward of God. So if it's a guy that's, you know, he's got a history of doing a lot of awful stuff as the steward of God and holding an office in the church, he's done a lot of bad things. When it comes to that, that's uh, not really meeting that qualification there. So that's what, ha that's what it has to be referring to. It can't refer to him being sinless because we're not sinless. It can't refer to him not having faults. You know, we're all going to have faults. But blameless as the steward of God. Has he done some shady stuff as a pastor in the past? Then he's not really meeting that qualification. And you're not going to find any man that's going to meet all these qualifications all the time or that's met all these qualifications in the past, you see. A bishop then must be blameless. Maybe he wasn't meeting uh, all the qualifications in the past. Maybe he did do something, messed up and did do something in the past, and where he wasn't blameless. But you can get blameless. He could get blameless by coming to the Lord getting forgiveness from the Lord and then getting forgiveness by anybody that he sinned against and openly did wrong. You see, then he could be considered blameless again. You know, I don't think failure is final. So you can't just disqualify somebody and say, well, he did this in the past, therefore he's, he's no longer qualified. Because, you see, just as the Lord can forgive him, we can forgive him. So, blameless, not sinless. It's blameless as a steward of God. Failure isn't final with the Father. So, he can get right and move on and meet that qualification again. Alright, the next one. This is the big one. This is the big one that everybody uh, talks about. That every, the only one that really anybody says anything about. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Now this is super controversial here. The husband of one wife. And a lot of people are going to shoot me when I say this. It has to be referring to polygamy. It has to be referring to more than one wife at a time. And before you shut me off, just hear me out. It has to be referring to polygamy, not divorce and remarriage. To teach that a divorced and remarried man has two living wives is basically just saying that God doesn't recognize a divorce when he actually does. Let's look at some verses that go along with it. 1 Corinthians 7.15 Now, the, uh, look at 1 Corinthians 7.15. And there are some ways that a person can be divorced and remarried and it not be a sin on their part. Now, when you talk about this, people say, well, you're supporting divorce. You're in favor of divorce. I'm not in favor of divorce, but I understand that divorces happen. God understands that divorces happen and are going to happen. 
So there's some grounds for divorce. And 1 Corinthians 7.15, the great chapter on marriage, it says, But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. You see that? It said, if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. If you've got a husband or wife that leaves you, you're not in bondage to stay single the rest of your life. You see, you can be divorced and remarried. If your spouse leaves you and you, you didn't even want it, you, you tried to make things right and stay married, but they leave you, you can't force somebody to stay with you so therefore, you're not in bondage the rest of your life having to stay single. So if you got remarried, there was no sin on your part when it comes to the divorce and remarriage. Now look down at 1 Corinthians seven thirty nine. It says in 1 Corinthians seven thirty nine, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. Only in the Lord. So if your spouse dies, you're free to get remarried and it not be a sin. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. Only in the Lord. And then Matthew 5.32. In Matthew 5.32... It says, But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. So you see that if, if your spouse committed fornication, you are free to re divorce and remarry. It doesn't mean you have to, but you're free to. Because they, when they join flesh with somebody else, they, join, they physically divorced you, joined flesh with another person, you're free to divorce and remarry. According to Matthew 5.32, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication. You know, if she joins flesh with somebody else, you are free to meet, remarry. If he joined flesh with somebody else, you are free to divorce and remarry. Do I recommend that you do? No, I think you should try to stay with that person, work things out. I never recommended divorce, but there are grounds for divorce. <clears throat> and to disqualify somebody from being the pastor because he's been divorced and remarried, doesn't make sense when if one of those things happened, maybe his spouse departed him, departed from him. He was not under, in bondage. He was free to remarry without sinning. If his spouse died, he was free to remarry. If she committed fornication, left him, cheated on him, got with somebody else, he was free to divorce and remarry. There was no sin on his part. So to disqualify him from being a pastor because of these situations that come up in life, maybe they don't come up in your life, but they come up in a bunch of other Christians' lives, to disqualify him because of that, it doesn't make sense. So if husband one wife equals, you know, one marriage ceremony, then... Even a widower couldn't remarry and continue to pastor. You see what I mean? You can't say that husband and one wife just means one wedding ring, one marriage ceremony, one life of all, of all his entire life. Because if that was so, then even somebody whose wife died, if he got remarried, he would be disqualified. So you can't interpret it as one marriage ceremony. It has to mean, it has to be referring to polygamy. And then you go back to what it said right before that. A bishop then must be, present tense, the husband 
of one wife. And if he got a divorce, he's no longer married to the former wife. Think about it. Think of somebody you know that's been divorced and remarried. When you look at that person, do you say, well, this man's got two wives. This man's got three wives. See, a lot of people are saying that uh, until his old wife dies, he's still married to her. That doesn't make sense. That's saying that God doesn't recognize the divorce when he does. If a man's been divorced from a woman, they're not married anymore. That's no longer his wife. And if he remarries, he doesn't have two wives, he just has one. So, he must be the husband of one wife, faithful to the one wife that he has. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, faithful to the one wife he has. Even though, even though Paul said it is better to marry than to burn, they want to get up and say that if you've been divorced, then you, you can't marry until your old spouse dies. There are pastors everywhere getting up saying that if you've been divorced, you cannot remarry until your old spouse dies, even though Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 9, I'm going to read it to you. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 9, he says, I, he says in verse 8, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. Meaning, single. He says, but if they could not contain, <clears throat> let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. Burn in your lust. It would be better to marry somebody than to walk around in your lust. And so you get like a 21 year old young guy. He gets married to somebody. She leaves him. And now he's 22. So he's supposed to stay single, according to them, until his other, his old spouse dies. That could be the rest of his life. So he's supposed to burn his lust until she dies. That's crazy. And he says, Unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let the husband not put her away. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. See, he's not suggesting divorce or recommending divorce. He says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. So you see, if they do depart, you're not under bondage. You don't have to stay single the rest of your life. But that's what people are going around trying to say. But Paul said... It's better to marry than to burn. And you see, these are ideal qualifications for a pastor, is what you've got in 1 Timothy 3. Nobody's going to meet all the qualifications all of the time. So yeah, this also proves that these are ideal qualifications for a pastor. You can't say a man who is single couldn't pastor. Let's talk about that too. Husband of one wife. So you say, well, if he's going to be a pastor, he has to be married. Okay, well, that doesn't completely work either because would you not have Paul for a pastor? Paul wasn't married. Would you not have the Lord Jesus Christ for a pastor when he was walking the earth in the flesh? He wasn't married. So the, what you've got here is ideal qualifications for a pastor. If a man is a husband of one wife, he's got a wife, uh, he's going to be more likely to be able to lead a congregation full of married people better if he's the husband of one wife. Ideally, you want somebody that's married, that's the husband, and, and has a family. 
because then he's going to be more likely to have of experience and wisdom with the family. But you uh, you can't just say that a guy who's single can't pastor because these are ideal qualifications. So, so this proves these are ideal qualifications for pastors. You can't say a man who is single couldn't pastor. That would disqualify Paul and Jesus Christ. But ideally, a married man can be an example and can help the congregation who are mostly married. And if husband of one wife means no divorce and remarriage, as in one marriage ceremony, also think about this. A whoremonger could meet the expectation, could meet the qualification. Think about that. So you got a guy. There are men who, before they were saved, they'll go out and they'll they'll sleep with 20 different women. And then they'll get saved and they'll settle down. They'll get a wife and they live a godly life the rest of the time. And if, if husband and one wife means only one marriage ceremony, then according to that, th that guy right there would meet the expectation or the qualification more than this another guy. Say this other guy who uh, never got into deep sin or nothing, maybe got saved at a young age, never got into deep sin or anything, and or maybe he didn't even get saved at a young age, but never uh, fornicated before he was married. And say he, he marries a woman, things go good for a while, then she leaves him. And he's, since he's a young guy, he definitely needs to get remarried because it's better to marry than to burn. So he gets married, he remarried. He's only been with his first wife and now the woman that he's married to. Never did any sexual sin. If, if these verse, if husband and one wife means one marriage ceremony, then you got the whoremonger, the guy that whored around, his entire life, uh, but had one marriage ceremony, you got him being more qualified than the guy who never whored around but had two marriage ceremonies, even though there was never any sin sexually on his part. You see how you this begins to not make sense? So a whoremonger can meet the expectation as long as he has more than one as long as he just has one marriage ceremony, if you take that interpretation of husband and one wife. Okay, and you don't really believe that husband and one wife means one marriage ceremony because just about anybody would tell you that if a man's wife dies, he can be remarried and still pastor. So deep down, you really don't believe that husband and one wife mean one marriage ceremony. You're given... You're given that exception for death, but what about the other grounds for divorce? If they depart. It said if they depart, you're not under bondage. If your husband or wife departs, you're not under bondage. So why wouldn't you give the exception for that as well? And why wouldn't you give the exception for the fornication? If your spouse committed fornication, you are free to remarry. So you can't just take the one exception and the verse didn't give any exceptions. It said the husband of one must be the husband of one wife. So husband of one wife cannot mean one marriage ceremony. Okay, the the a bishop must be present tense blameless. Blameless as the steward of God doesn't mean sinless. The husband of one wife. He must be faithful to the one wife he has. And he, he, you know, he can't have more than one wife at once, obviously. And people think that sounds crazy when you say that this is referring to polygamy. Because they're thinking of Bible Belt America or something where nobody's doing that. But there are cultures today where you have people still having more than one wife. 
You know, the Bible is not just limited to you in Bible Belt America. You see what I mean? Uh, and throughout the Bible, what do you see? You even see God's people with more than one wife at a time. So they just act like it's ludicrous to say husband and one wife is referring to polygamy when there's no other way. I've done showed you that there's no other way you can look at it. And all these people have more than one wife throughout the Bible. Abraham, Jacob, David, Solomon. I mean, they all did. And you've got people going around taking it even further than holding an office. you got them going around saying you can't even preach if you've had more than one wife. They're saying you can't even write a book if you about the Bible if you've had more than one wife. Maybe you can teach a Sunday school class or something. You're treated as a lower class Christian if you've been divorced and remarried. And I've never been divorced. So I'm not I don't have any bias on the on this here. If anything, um it would be easy for me to just go along with everybody and say that a divorced and remarried person can't pastor. That would save me from being shunned. But I believe the truth is a husband, uh, I believe the truth is a divorced and remarried person can pastor or can be a deacon. You got some of the best people at a church sometimes have been divorced and remarried and would do even a better job as a deacon than the current deacons, but they are not allowed to be a deacon because they say, well, they've got more than one wife. They've been divorced and remarried or something like that. So that's the most controversial one. So it says, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant. Okay, that's the next one, vigilant. That's watchful, circumspect, looking at things at all sides. You know, a pastor needs to be vigilant because, you know, Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant because the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Our adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So a pastor needs to be vigilant, watchful, looking at things from all sides, just as a good husband or father watches after his family. You see, being a family man, husband and a father is ideal as the local church is a family itself. Now, that doesn't mean the pastor must have a family or a wife, but that's an ideal thing that you would look for. So he needs to be vigilant. He needs to be blameless. The husband of one wife. And we'll go ahead and stop with that one there. And we'll pick up with the next qualification, which is sober, next time.